Good evening, it's uh, Paul Beckwith. I'm at the AGU conference in New Orleans. Most of the events have uh, finished up for the day. So I just wanted to convey uh, some of my thoughts on the conference as I walk uh, for about 20 minutes over to B.B. King's uh, Jazz Club. Richard Alley, who's, uh, I guess he's getting up there in age. He's a climate uh, science uh, guy who's been studying um, methane, among other things, for quite a few years. Is uh, hosting an open mic session at this place I'm going to. Basically, uh, anybody can go up and talk on earth science or planetary stuff, so yeah, it'd be interesting. Good music and free food, so I'm heading there. Um, you can see this uh, casino right behind me as I walk along Convention uh, Street. And, uh, you know, this casino is kind of a metaphor for what we're doing to our planet. You know, I often talk about the climate casino, you know, what city will be next to fall or be disrupted by either torrential rains leading to floods or drought or, you know, loss of uh, local food supply or fires. I, I guess you'd have to say that Ventura County in California is this week's uh, loser in the climate casino. You know, those fires are unprecedented and uh, Santa Ana winds have changed because of climate. They're blowing faster, the duration is longer, and uh, we had a lot of rain there, unusual rain in the spring. All the vegetation grew up, you know, large amounts of vegetation growth with all the rain, and then in the summer and fall, it's been no rain basically, drought conditions, all of the uh, vegetation has died and it's like a tinderbox and it's all burning now putting up huge amounts of uh, emissions into the atmosphere over California. Not to mention all the particulates and stuff that are affecting people's health. So, the climate conference is it's a massive affair. And unlike the uh, COP conferences, the COP conferences, climate of parties, intergovernmental panel on climate change every year where the negotiators go and sit down and they talk, 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 and then they clap hands and say, you know, success and leave and they feel good, pat each other on the back. And meanwhile, carbon emissions still continue to skyrocket and governments around the world are still subsidizing fossil fuel companies to the tune of uh, $5 trillion a year. So follow the money until that number changes. You know, until these fossil fuel companies get no subsidies and this money is going into, uh, you know, renewable energy and uh, mitigation ideas and things like that, then, uh, you know, just don't believe what they say. So, this conference is a really major deal. 25,000 uh, scientists. There's 54 parallel sessions. So, you know, I look at the uh, program and there's 54 sessions and the problem is, is the convention center is so massive that, uh, you know, the talks are 15 minutes long. You want to talk in one session and, uh, you know, then there's a talk in a different session on the other side of the building, then forget it. It'll take you 20 minutes to walk over there. You know, I don't know how long the building is. It must be you know, a mile plus or something. So, so this is one of the uh, problems. So you really have to be kind of selective in the uh, session. To a session today and I just stayed there for all of the talks. I don't know, there are about eight talks or something. Um, it's very disappointing because a couple of the speakers didn't show, so the convener just showed the slides, you know, and that was pretty uh, bad, but I mean, that's an exception, I think. Most, most speakers uh, are, are committed and show up. I guess they won't get invited back if they don't. So uh, the talk was basically on ways to, you know, there's an awful lot of satellite data. One of the things with climate change is there's far more data than there are people to analyze all that data. So 
you know, and people, in order to do it, they have to get some sort of funding. Um, and uh, if they don't have the funding, then the work doesn't get done. Of course, funding has been a big issue. It's one of the things, especially with U.S. scientists this year, you know, people are extremely worried. You know, just yesterday on Monday, opening day, Dan Rather gave a keynote talk at 12.30, which was attended, I don't know, 10,000 people could fit into that room maybe. It was pretty phenomenal. And it was all about, you know, what's happening, you know, what the politics is like in the U.S. about lack of science funding, lack of respect for science, lack of respect for experts in general, and how do we, how do we turn this around? What do we do? And, uh, you know, we talked about the rot in the system, you know, how scientists aren't recognized. We talk, talked about how experts aren't recognized. And, uh, you know, we talked about how it basically stemmed from the uh, top, right? He was very critical of the Trump administration and where it was going, what it was doing, and uh, the lack of uh, basically defense for science. I mean, scientists aren't the best for defending themselves, so when they're under attack, there's, I think I can just go here. So when they're under attack, um, they don't do a very good job of defending themselves. They're not very organized. Um, they're not, uh, there is a group at the conference, a group of attorneys who are there specifically to, uh, you know, for scientists to talk to if they need legal defense, if there's lawsuits uh, against them for things that they've said or so on. So, and this, I guess, stems back to uh, Michael Mann, um, who was, you know, people like people in Congress asked him to turn over all his emails and so on, and you know they were threatening stuff against him. So he had a lot of legal defense uh, for that. I, I bumped into Michael Mann uh, yesterday on Monday. It was, he was talking to a whole group of people. I didn't get a chance to talk to him myself, but he is giving a talk, a couple talks, so I'll make sure I go to those talks. So one of the things I'm gonna prioritize is, uh, you know, who the people are giving talk, because there's certain people I wanna meet. Um, you know, so I, wanna, I wanna basically meet the, you know, the top experts in all of these different fields. You know, I think Jason Box has some talks. I don't know if he's here, I think he is. Richard Alley uh, has written many books and see him tonight. Michael Mann, of course, author, very well known in climate science, you know, and uh, there's lots of other people. I'd like to meet some of the people working on methane in the Arctic, for example. Um, one of the things I'm finding out, and it's really no surprise to me, is that the, you know, this is definitely a uh, world of specialists that we're talking about here, right? It's uh, people, in order to do really good work at science, you have to specialize in a very, very narrow field. And that's not conducive to solving climate change or dealing with climate change, right? In order to deal with, effectively with climate change, you have to recognize how severe the problem is. And that's just not, there's no sign of that at this conference, right? There's no sign of urgency. There's no sign that, hey, sea, earth, sea ice is going to, you know, vanish very soon. In fact, it, when it, some of the Arctic uh, ice talks, where it was all satellite guys talking about their algorithms to detect sea ice better, because if it's first year ice or multi-year ice, it's very thick. The automatic uh, satellite systems and algorithms detect it and do daily updates. So there's things that are like National Snow and Ice Data Center results or Cryosphere Today, the sea ice area, the, the National Snow and Ice Data Center is for sea ice area. Cryosat is for thickness. Um, and those are, those are well-developed algorithms and they crank out the data, but there's areas, they're, they're good for first year ice, they're good for multi-year ice but they're not very good around the edges of the ice. They're good within the ice, but around the edges of the ice, especially, um, they're not very good. They're not very good when there's melt ponds on top of the ice, but they categorize that as ice or water, even though it's water sitting on top of the ice. 
at the edges of the ice where you can have a lot of submerged ice. You know, you can, any, if the ice is less than about 30 minutes, centimeters thick, they're very, very poor at resolving that. And also, you know, there's always a trade-off between the detail and the range that you cover. So if you've got a satellite, if you've got like radar sat 8, which is uh, high resolution, but it's only going to be monitoring a specific, you know, small area with an image because it's high resolution, then, you know, what if, how do you, how do you, there's tre tremendous amounts of data covering the whole Arctic. So how do you, uh, you know, how do you work with that data? And it's only, uh, um, you know, there's issues with, you know, coverage, how often does the satellite pass over, things like that. So, so uh, I was looking at that. And uh, also, um, so that, you know, the, uh, the uh, MODIS satellite, which has much wider coverage, much lower resolution, but it covers a vast area of the Arctic. And there's also some interesting work at one of these talks on military satellites. So for a long time, military satellites have been monitoring the Arctic, the northern regions, and the infrared region like two micron, two to three micron or something like that. And the reason is they're looking for the hot exhaust of missiles. So during the Cold War, you know, missiles were fired up from the Soviet Union towards the US or uh, then they, their signatures would be detected as soon as they were launched. So these satellites have been looking at the, looking down and there's reams and reams of data on sea ice over the, that, but they're only looking at it at one specific wavelength. So the paper was seeing, well, what data can we extract on sea ice from this wavelength? And there's some very interesting work to uh, figure out, you know, the sea ice motion and flows and all this other stuff just through this, uh, through this work. So there's a paper on that. Um, I went to some papers on uh, different, some of the different uh, consequences that are happening from climate change, uh, disease vectors increasing around the world. So there's a couple issues with that. Uh, one of the issues is the areas that used to get cold before are no longer getting cold, so this is a big problem. Um, you know, like anything else, you know, life is uh, basically a big set of series of complex chemical reactions. So the Arrhenius equation, anytime temperature is higher, the reaction rates increase, things can multiply biological life can multiply more quickly, things like that, you know, within limits until the temperature gets above a threshold, um, of often the threshold for, say, bacterial growth or spore growth or whatever. So I was looking at, there was a talk on valley fever, for example. Um, so valley fever, you know, if I don't know too much about it, or didn't before this talk, but it happens in the U.S. Uh, southwest, as long as the temperature is above the mean temperature is above 11 degrees Celsius, and the rainfall is less than 600 millimeters annually, I believe, then there's a high probability that valley fever will take off in those regions. So, so as uh, climate change proceeds, uh, we're going to see more outbreaks of this of valley fever outside of the traditional regions where it's been seen. So the U.S. Southwest, um, you know, the right-hand border is basically the dry line um, you know, the divide uh, comes up uh, from the Gulf of Mexico, so if you're to the east of it, if you're to the right of it on the map, then um, there's, there's a lot more moisture coming up from the Gulf, and if you're to the west of it, or to the left of it on the map, it's very, very dry, and this is an area where you get a lot of uh, extreme weather events happening. Temperature won't change across the dry line, but the humidity does change right here. Man, on from the my town, I need a dry, very dry on the western side. Whoa! And that's the limit of this, uh, that's kind of the limit of this, um, uh, of, of this uh, region that, it, it, it's sort of the eastern limit of where you get this valley fever. So, so as climate increases and the, the whole region dries out more, less rainfall, temperature rises more, so that it can extend outside of that region where it's going to be seen, and it can extend up right up into Canada, for, for example. So there's all kinds of talks, you know, there's a lot of stuff to digest. I'm not allowed to take uh, pictures or film right inside the sessions. A lot of the papers will be online after the conference. Uh, all the abstracts uh, should be available in a summary digest. But anyway, 